Hello and welcome to today's View on Africa briefing on whether new laws and new deals can quell mass migration. I'm Otilia Anamanganidze and I'm the head of special projects here at the ISS. Um, perhaps to start off in terms of where we have been. In 2016, hundreds of thousands of people attempted to make the journey across the Mediterranean from the African continent into Europe. So far in 2017, over 27,000 people as of this Sunday had attempted that journey, with several hundred having lost their lives. That is the status quo. For Europe, it has identified this as a serious migration crisis, not only about the people who are moving from the African continent, but from other parts of the world, including the Middle East and parts of Asia. The reasons that people choose to leave their countries uh, essentially in search of a better life are varied. They include economic reasons and a search of a better economic life for themselves, as well as for their families. At the same time, they also include people who are fleeing from repressive governments or spaces in which they're not able to freely express themselves. They're people that are also escaping conflict, as well as violent extremism and the range of crimes that are committed in their countries. Many of these people actually seek refuge in neighboring countries. But as we have seen over the past five years, a significant amount of them choose instead to go as far as possible from where they come from. A number of them attempt to cross the Mediterranean with thousands having died over the past five years seeking to attempt that journey. So it's not just about the people moving themselves, but it is about really trying to look at why people are moving. The question that I'll be trying to answer today is whether the new frameworks, the new deals, the new laws are actually geared to addressing those challenges or whether they're focusing singularly on trying to quell mass migration and particularly mass migration northwards. In doing that, I will focus obviously on African migration, but also I'm very mindful of the fact that the large numbers of migrants over the past um, three to five years have actually been from the Middle East. But for the most part, the movement within the African continent, movement out of the African continent, except where there are people who have died trying to cross into Europe, has largely been ignored. But numbers do matter. The numbers, not just of those people who have died, but the numbers of those attempting to cross over do matter. They matter because particularly where the people are leaving the African continent and moving into a much smaller continent like Europe with far fewer countries, it means that those countries, for the most part, do become overwhelmed by the mass influx of numbers. So perhaps the issue is not so much whether or not people should be moving because that is something that is more difficult to control, but whether or not the management of the people moving is something that we can do at this stage. On the EU's part, there has been a clear recognition that the numbers are way too much for them to be able to support. At the same time, they have sought to uh, enter into deals with African countries, with the African Union, as well as countries elsewhere in Eastern Europe and in the Middle East in order to address this issue. On the part of African countries, while there is a recognition of the mass outflows of people from the continent, there has been less action in terms of how do we address the actual causes of people moving. And so in really trying to look at the various, uh, what I will be focusing on is the various strategies that have been employed, and I'll look at them from the national level, and then I'll also look at them from the multilateral and bilateral deals that have been struck, and then how this all fits in in terms of the existing regional policies, um, particularly with a focus, obviously, on the African Union. So it is around asking, what are these policies? What are these practices? And ultimately, whether or not these practices and policies are actually addressing what the real problem is. Moving away from the African continent and moving away from the European uh, context as well, 
uh, over the past year, two years, we have been hearing quite a lot in terms of the need to build walls, imaginary or physical walls to put people out. There has to be a conversation around whether the construction of walls in and of itself actually limits people coming in or whether it increases the chances that those people will seek to still cross those borders, jump those walls, but through illegal means. Coming closer to home within the South African context, there have been attempts to review the immigration law and to review the immigration laws in a way that actually uh, limits the, the number of people coming into the African continent, uh, sorry, into S South Africa, while at the same time trying to encourage specific forms of movement. So trying to encourage those people who can invest and those people that the South African government views as integral to, to building the South African economy. The problem is, and perhaps lessons from South Africa can be learned elsewhere in the world, the problem is if your immigration regulations become so stringent, uh, it doesn't necessarily make people who want to move change their minds on whether they want to come to South Africa, but rather it makes them look for other options in terms of how to get there. A lot of the research that the Institute for Security Studies has done over the past two years has been to look at the rise in an economy of smuggling and looking at how smuggling in and of itself has become a, a business enabling greater movement, but also ensuring that a number of the people who are moving are harder to identify. So the question is in balancing whether or not you need more immigrants coming in, but also whether or not you want to be able to track the people who are coming into your country, the stricter the laws, the higher the chance that more people will look for illegal means to come into the country where they can. At the same time, moving a little bit further north from South Africa into East Africa, we have a situation where in Kenya there, are, um, there have been multiple attempts to date to close uh, Dadaab refugee camp. Whether that in and of itself will be a good move is something that has uh, stirred a lot of controversy. For the Kenyan government, they are concerned about the increase in violent extremism and their difficulty in terms of regulating movement into the country, but also movement within the country and the way in which the refugee camp is run. But at the same time, and perhaps uh, mindful of the fact that Kenya is in a neighborhood where there are current conflicts going on in Somalia as well as in South Sudan, the likelihood that the country will continue to receive uh, refugees is still high. So what do these national policies, national laws then actually respond to if not responding to um, existing concerns and existing um, needs within the region to be able to deal with, be it conflict, be it violent extremism, or be it repressive governments. In terms now, looking, I suppose, to more of a, a continental level and looking not only at the African continent, but also looking at what the European Union um, has attempted to do over the past couple of years to address the surge in migration. I refer, it, uh, I refer to it as brokering deals and tightening screws, um, but who are the people behind that and who are trying essentially to broker those deals and tighten those screws on mass migration on the, from the African continent, less so within the African continent. Coming out uh, from the Valletta conference in 2015, which focused on trying to address uh, what was then identified as a European migration crisis with mass numbers of people moving not only from the African continent, but also from the Middle East and parts of Asia into Europe, was on the part of the European Union, a desire to see that at least the issues around migration are properly managed. European countries, not only member states of the European Union, but also including uh, countries like Switzerland, uh, put forward close to 2 billion euros that were set aside for the emergency trust fund on migration. The rolling out of projects under this trust fund for migration began uh, early last year 
and the rollout is continuing. Most recently, with uh, funds set aside for Libya, Tunisia, as well as Egypt, in terms of them managing their borders better, but then also in terms of them um, being able to receive returnees or people deported from the European Union. Essentially, this trust fund focuses on several particular regions on the African continent. It focuses on North Africa. It focuses on the Sahel and the Lake Chad Basin. And then it also focuses on the Horn of Africa. At the moment, there is very little in terms of focus on Southern Africa. Um, and perhaps there does need to be that focus. What the South African government has said quite recently is while movement is being regulated northwards, there's very little effort in regulating movement southwards. So uh, from their point of view, the consequences of the European Union uh, tightening the screws, as it were, on migration coming northwards has been that more people, particularly from the Horn of Africa, have chosen instead to come southwards. So you have that and you have the series of projects that have been rolled out uh, by the European Union. Whether there will be any successes in this is still uh, anyone's guess. It's still a long way away from successes in part because any of these projects will only be as successful as they have clear long-term um, implications and clear long-term plans and strategies. In the short term, ad hoc mechanisms do have to be put in place. In fact, ensuring that countries are able to deal with outflows, but also that are, they're able to deal with incoming movement is very important. But if those are simply knee-jerk reactions to an increase in migration that aren't actually looking quite specifically at what this has in terms of implications in the medium and the longer term, then it will be cycles of knee-jerk reactions seeking to address problems as and when they come. Perhaps to use an, an analogy of a ship, it is almost as if you are trying to plug the holes of a sinking ship in the hope that you can at least get to shore. The question being, where exactly is that ship moving to? And mindful, of course, that a number of people are making their journeys in ships similar to those. So what those deals are at the moment are individual deals with specific countries. Earlier this year, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel was in Africa uh, meeting with a number of countries in terms of brokering the deals that are needed in terms of the countries that can then receive incoming migrants or migrants coming from Europe who have been deported, but also looking towards what sustainable solutions they can be. While negotiating these deals, it is very important to get full understanding of what, for example, Egypt um, would want to, to have considered in those negotiations, what Tunisia and what Libya would have to, to be fully considered so that these deals are not one-sided, nor that they are simply based on um, incentives or sustainable or development incentives over actually looking at more sustainable efforts to, to addressing them. The new laws, I've spoken already about South Africa looking to review its immigration laws, and also within Uganda and Kenya looking to see whether or not their refugee laws are not a bit too lax. The challenge there is ultimately whatever laws and frameworks are put in place, the first point of departure is to do as little harm as possible. So then the question is, will any of this work? And can any of this work? And will, who will be the ultimate beneficiaries? Are we addressing migra migration for the sake of states? Or are we addressing migra migration for the sake of those people who find it difficult to stay in their own countries. And so the test of whether these policies and whether these laws will actually be effective will be in looking at whether the people wanting to move choose instead not to. And their decision not to move is not on the basis that it's way too difficult to move to that other country, but rather that conditions within their countries, so conditions at home, are such that they actually prefer to stay at home. And ultimately, it is also about ensuring that the national laws 
the regional policies, as well as the various deals between the European Union and uh, African states, as well as with the African Union, are not competing, but are actually complementary and support each other and are geared towards the promotion of the same aims. But this is not to say that ad hoc responses should be done away with. The fact of the matter is, as we speak, people are trying to move and that does need to be addressed in, in, in the best way possible and in a way that does the least harm. But those ad hoc responses must be part of a broader plan in, uh, that is more sustainable and that is a longer term plan. Ultimately, uh, building on ISS research so far, which has looked at migration uh, through the lens of the migrants themselves and the lens of smugglers themselves, whatever those solutions are, must be solutions that ultimately allow for people to be able to choose to stay at home or where they are moving, that they aren't, uh, that we aren't making those who are already vulnerable and uh, more susceptible to abuse. And at the same time, that the laws and policies do not encourage a growing political economy of smuggling. So ultimately, the proper implementation of decisions from the European Union, decisions from the African Union is, is, is integral. It is key that the African Union and the European Union sit together and discuss and devise actual strategies that are mutually beneficial and that are not one-sided. Whatever those strategies must be uh, are strategies that can be used today, but strategies that actually have a longer-term impact. I cannot stress enough the importance of ensuring that the strategies are not just addressing today's problems, but they are ultimately also ensuring that we don't see a resurgence of forced mass migration in the coming decades. This requires more than monetary investment. So 2 billion euros seems like a lot of money, provided the programming is clear and that the programming actually aims to achieve sustainable goals. But at the same time, it also requires human resource uh, investment. It requires a lot in terms of strategic investment on the part of African countries, as well as the European Union, to be, a, to be able to address the issues. It is not enough to control the borders without controlling why people make their way to the borders. And as a last point for me, whatever those strategies are, they cannot just be migration strategies. There is a recognition that people are moving because they are either fleeing or seeking a better life elsewhere. So from the push factors, they are fleeing a, a difficult life, they're fleeing conflict, repressive governments, violent extremism in some instances, or simply unable to make a livelihood for themselves. In the pull factors, they're, they're fleeing because they see a better life elsewhere. So the strategies that need to be employed aren't just strategies looking at stopping movement. They should be strategies looking at developing and building governance structures, responding to crime, responding to conflict. And ultimately, it is those strategies that will quell migration. Thank you.